Across America and the world, in the depths of forests, is an elusive man-like creature, Bigfoot, Sasquatch. Thousands of reports, photos and videos pour in each year of Bigfoot encounters from all 49 continental states and Canada. We're talking about a living, breathing population. There has to be a minimum of 4,000 animals roaming North America. And public interest is only increasing. It's very mainstream. It's cool to be into Bigfoot. Bigfoot fervor is at a fever pitch in this country. But what exactly are these mysterious creatures that have caught so much attention? What does science have to say about them? And why are many so sure they exist? We've set out to find the truth in Chasing Bigfoot. Since the first recorded sighting of Bigfoot in 1811, a stream of reports and media has flooded newspapers, television, and the internet. And an astonishing number of people have had first-hand experiences. I saw a Bigfoot, I'd run and hug him. Yes, I would like to see a Bigfoot. I'd see the yellow of its teeth and just change my life forever. Many want to see Bigfoot, and many have seen Bigfoot, starting since the 1800s. In the Antioch Ledger in 1870, an anonymous correspondent published their account of an alleged Bigfoot encounter near Mount Diablo in California, titled, The Wild Man of Crow Canyon he observed two Bigfoots visiting his camp. While he was in hiding, he wrote, it was in the image of man, but it could not have been human. The creature, whatever it was, stood fully five feet high and disproportionately broad and square at the shoulders with arms of great length. The hole was covered with dark brown and cinnamon colored hair. He started to go and having gone a short distance, he returned and was joined by another a female, unmistakably. When they both turned and walked past me within 20 yards of where I sat and disappeared in the brush. The story was printed several times in California newspapers and has become an important account in Bigfoot history. Ron Bowles, today a Bigfoot researcher, came across a Bigfoot as a young man. While heading back to the car after a canceled kegger party near Springfield, Missouri, he and his friends stopped when they came across a strange smell. There were seven of us there. There was three guys in front of us, and there was two guys in, way up behind us, and then there was three of us walking in a group. Uh, one guy was named Mike, the other guy was named Gene, and we just kept on walking, and then not more than four or five steps after Gene uh, said something about the smell, he just stopped. And he was looking over his right shoulder, you know, due west, and he goes, and he just stopped and he goes, oh my God. And I'm looking over there and sure enough, uh, from where we were standing, it was approximately 15, 20 feet away behind a tree that uh, was probably no more than a foot in diameter, was this big, huge, figure and it was doing this number behind that tree like that you know and uh, I was looking at that and he was looking at that and of course Mike was and I looked behind me to make sure those two guys were behind us because I didn't want someone you know pulling a leg on me no they were back there I looked in front of me those guys were there too and then I looked back and this thing was just doing this number Gene uh, at that point, he goes, I can't handle this. And he took off running. Being that he was the biggest one out of the bunch of us, I followed suit. Compelled by an inexplicable desire to understand what he saw, 
Within 40 minutes, Ron Bowles went back. We went to the exact spot, and there was no smell, and there was nothing behind that tree. To this day, that still affects my dreams. It's still a uh, sort of a embodiment of my, I mean, when something comes up in my life where, you know, like a new job or, or a new house or something, you know, a big change in my life, I still have a weird dream about Bigfoots out there in the woods looking at me. And it's almost like a, uh, it's sort of like the uh, representation of the, uh, of the unknown. Dr. Russ Jones is a lead investigator and author. He has spoken to many Bigfoot witnesses. You know, I've had witnesses where it was traumatizing. I've had witnesses have had to get counseling for post-traumatic stress and people that have moved from wilderness areas into areas where, um, you know, maybe it's a city or it's more developed because of the traumatizing experience that they've had. It seems unlikely that a president of the United States and Bigfoot would be connected. But in the Frontiersman's 1890 book titled The Wilderness Hunter, Theodore Roosevelt recounted a story about a trapper named Bauman and his partner at a pass in Wisdom River. The pass had an evil reputation because the year before, a solitary hunter who had wandered into it was slain, seemingly by a wild beast. At dusk, they again reached camp. They were surprised to find that during their absence, something, apparently a bear, had visited camp and had rummaged about among their things, scattering the contents of their packs and in sheer wantonness, destroying their lean-to. Bauman's partner soon remarked that the bear had been walking on two legs. After the camp was again destroyed and after two nights of spotting a creature in the distance, Bauman went to collect beaver traps and returned to camp. At first, Bauman could see nobody, nor did he receive an answer to his call. Stepping forward, he again shouted, and as he did so, his eye fell on the body of his friend, stretched beside the trunk of a great fallen spruce. The body was still warm, but that the neck was broken, while there were four great fang marks in the throat. Bauman, utterly unnerved and believing that the creature with which he had to deal was something either half-human or half-devil, some great goblin beast, abandoned everything but his rifle and struck off at speed down the pass, not halting until he reached the beaver meadows where the hobbled ponies were still grazing. Mounting, he rode onwards through the night until beyond reach of pursuit. Was this mysterious, vicious creature a Bigfoot? Only Bauman's fallen partner will ever know. Scott Barta is an author and member of the Sasquatch Investigations of the Rockies, or Sir. His first possible encounter took place in a nine-foot-tall tent while on a Bigfoot investigation. About four, four o'clock in the morning, I just woke up for no reason, and I looked at the back of the tent, and there was a giant conical uh, shadow. It looked like an upside-down pine tree. In other words, it was tapered this way going up with shoulders. Our uh, outfitter's tent is nine feet uh, tall. And this head was about three feet over the top of that. And it was conical. And then it went down into these shoulders and then it went down. But I had this overwhelming feeling that it, that it was a tree and that the moon was hitting it. So I looked at it for like 15 minutes and it didn't do anything, it didn't move, and so I just went, went back to bed. And then the next morning I got up to go look and see what tree it was that had to have made that, that shadow. I couldn't find one. And I found the ground was mashed down and there was a huge kind of print. It wasn't a, a real discernible print, but it was definitely a giant print, like over 17 inches. So for the next four nights, I kept looking at the, uh, the back of the tent to see, because the moon did the same thing and the sky was clear pretty much. So the weather and everything stayed pretty much the same for the next four days. And not one shadow ever came over that, 
back of that tent. It's like that with witnesses, you know, I'll interview people and they'll tell me almost invariably that they think about their experience almost each day. I'm here to tell you that I'm based very much in reality, but you, you can't deny it. a mind that's been changed by experiences can't go back to its original dimensions. I'm stealing that from some poet, but uh, it's the truth. And so I either have to, I have to accept and embrace what's happened, or I have to deny that it ever happened. And I can't do that anymore. So that's where I am at this point. 1924, British Columbia, Canada. Albert Ostman, having heard of man beasts roaming the woods, headed into the forest to go camping. He reported that while he was sleeping, he was abducted by a Bigfoot that carried him for three hours before dropping him onto a plateau. Surrounding him was a family of Bigfoots who held him captive for six days until he escaped by feeding snuff to the large male, which made him groggy. After staying silent for more than 24 years after the event, in 1957, he told his story to a newspaper, which has gone down in Bigfoot history. They were all covered with hair. In 1997, Mark DeWorth came across what he thought at first could only be a black bear while in the forests of Ohio. All of a sudden, I see this thing start standing up like going up in an upward position. And I'm thinking I'm gonna see ears here in a, in a mouth or, or, or a nose. And, uh, and all of a sudden it turns and looks at me. And when it started turning, I could see this and a flat face. And then I kind of you know, got myself under control and it looked at me and at the distance, basically the only thing I could make out was more like this. Like it couldn't believe, I, it, I think it thought I was back at my vehicle. And somehow it passed me up rather than staying with me. And, uh, and when I saw it, I could not believe it. I'm like, oh my God, it, I think this is a Bigfoot. And when, it, uh, when you saw how big the thing was, it was like incredible. And I had a camera in my pack, so I swung my bag around. And when I did, I went to reach in. That's when it turned and just went right up the next tier and it was gone. I mean, it just really affected me from an emotional standpoint point because when you don't expect things to happen they happen and and then after that day I came to the realization that you know what I always said about 10 percent of my witnesses were telling the truth but at once seeing one with, with my own eyes I came to the realization that you know maybe more of these people are seeing these things and these aren't just made up stories and that they're that these things are alive and well and living in the Buckeye State. In October of 1955, near Tet Joan Cash, British Columbia, a highway worker went to scout out an area for a future hunt. That worker was named William Rowe, and his story is considered a classic in Bigfoot history. As he tells it, I had just come out of a patch of low brush into a clearing when I saw what I thought was a grizzly bear. A moment later, it raised up and stepped out into the opening. Then I saw it was no bear. My first impression was of a huge man about six feet tall, almost three feet wide, and probably weighing somewhere near 300 pounds. It was covered from head to foot with dark brown silver tipped hair. But as it came closer, I saw by its breasts that it was a female. Finally, the wild thing must have got my scent for it looked directly at me through an opening in the brush. A look of amazement crossed its face. It backed up three or four short steps, then straightened up to its full height and started to walk rapidly back the way it had come. For a moment, it watched me over its shoulder as it went, not exactly afraid, but as though it wanted no contact with anything strange. Whether this was a Sasquatch, I do not know. It will always remain a mystery to me unless another one is found. Signed, William Rowe. Shane Carpenter is a mixed martial artist and Bigfoot researcher. He has been closely studying a family of Bigfoots. He first saw them on a hike in southern Missouri. I stepped about 20 foot in off the trail into the woods and there they were. There was five of them. I could see their heads poking up behind a big brush pile and uh, I took a few pictures and uh, 
went on about my way. Anyway, to make a long story short, I've been going out there since. And, uh, you know, 2013, it was just absolutely crazy. I had a moment where I came home one night on a Friday night and uh, just had to sit on the porch for a while and talk with my wife. And I was really questioning my sanity and, you know, questioning why, you know, why was this happening to me? Why, you know, why did this fall in my lap? I, I went through a went through a little moment of questioning myself and what was happening and uh, kind of a reality check, you know, and uh, and uh, once I got through that, it's just kind of been, you know, uphill since. Shane's son, Chance, had his own experience with one of the females in the family. We were going to this nesting area where we would leave our stuff and she ha was like, you couldn't really tell, but it looked like her hand was sitting out. And then she popped her head out from around the corner. And I looked just at the right time and caught the glimpse of her looking at us. On a youth camp out, Shane and Tanner Davis, a youth pastor, had an experience with the Bigfoot family. We're actually, where we camped out was a couple miles, at least a mile and a half, maybe two miles from where where, uh, where I go in at. About 12.30-ish, um, there was two pretty loud whoops. <laughs> we were in our tent and we heard that whoop and my wife and I looked at each other and we were like, is that what we think it is? And then he came back, he says, it is. <laughs> and then we spent the next several hours listening out by the campfire yeah. and heard a lot of activity. Whoops, so. tree knocks, uh, rock clacks, so we crawled into our tents, and then at some point, um, so 3:30 or 4 o'clock, yeah, yeah, rocks started raining down on the tents. And then we wake up that morning, and you know it was sun up. We had eaten some breakfast, and Shane was he said, "Hey Tanner, come here." And so he took me out back. We had a line of our tents together, and he took us back behind. It was just he and I, and he said, "You got to check this out." And so he we walked through about 10 or 15 feet just behind our tents and he pointed to the ground and my eyes got real big I was like is that seriously what I think it is he said like, yep and he put his hand next to it and I took a photo of uh, an impression in some soft soil I mean it was 16 to 15 inches you know six seven inches wide a perfect indentation of a foot it is true that not all possible Bigfoot experiences are sightings and this huge tree break happened. I hear noises. We saw some tracks. I heard a loud crack behind us. But it was circling around the perimeter of my truck. I heard that distinct sound of the car door handle being lifted up and dropping back down in place. Other occurrences, such as wood knocks, rocks being thrown, and moved items in the woods are often attributed to Bigfoot. One of the things that's just unbelievable to me is they have the uncanny ability of staying hidden and to know exactly how far they can push the envelope before they expose themselves. Indeed, when people actually see the elusive creatures, it is often by accident. The number one way to have a Sasquatch encounter, statistically, is have one cross the road in front of your vehicle. Most of the sightings that have ever happened that have been recorded have happened that way. So you go out as a human being into their habitat and you go try to find one and you're almost gonna win the lottery twice before you walk one down or just happen to find one. They're so elusive and there's so few of them and they're so incredibly intelligent. It's funny, the people that seem to see Bigfoot the most are the people who are not looking for a Bigfoot. They're out hiking, they may or may not believe in Bigfoot and they have an encounter. And some of them have been dramatic encounters, close daytime encounters that have so rocked these people's world that um, they almost go into hiding for weeks after the event because everything they thought they knew about the world and about the woods and everything, suddenly they see a creature that they thought was a myth and it was real. And you'll see some witnesses where, you know, from an emotional standpoint, it might break them down because sometimes the experiences aren't shiny and happy because when you're not expecting to see something like this, it could really throw a wrench in your day. Many who have had Bigfoot encounters experience a wide range of emotions. Psychologically, it was, it was I, I was in shock. 
Oh, I wasn't scared. I was I was shocked that you know I think just like everybody is. And I'm I get excited about it. And I think so many people that are in the woods for their lifetime and are always in there. When you have an experience that happens to you, it just sticks with you, and you always just wonder, you know, what was that? So if you happen to come across a Bigfoot, what should you do? If if you're lucky enough to see a Bigfoot, um and the animals left, I mean, you should definitely investigate the area, look for footprints, get your cell phone out, take a lot of pictures, put something down for scale. Um, definitely do not hesitate to report it to one of the, you know, one of the uh, groups that are, um, you know, collecting the data. The BFRO is a good one. But definitely just don't keep it to yourself. Share the evidence. In 1967, along Bluff Creek, California, the most famous of all Bigfoot videos was recorded. Indeed, this iconic image of Bigfoot originates from the Patterson-Gimlin film. Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin were riding on horseback when they spotted a figure across the creek. Patterson grabbed his camera and filmed a bipedal, ape-like creature walk and disappear into the trees. The authenticity of the film is hotly debated but today, it is still considered one of the greatest pieces of Bigfoot evidence. But while there is a plethora of sightings that have been recorded, it is likely that many go unreported. Probably 25% of the reports are, are filed, you know, no, 75% go unfiled because nobody wants to be, you know, whether embarrassed or humiliated. I think most people are in shock when they see something like that simply because they don't think that it's going to be there and, and they're not going to see something like that. And, uh, and then they don't know what to do. You know, who do you tell? Uh, do you go to the authorities with this? Are, are they going to ridicule you? Are they going to make fun of you? Uh, do you? Do you get online to, you know, who do you trust on, on the internet, you know, to, to treat this with respect? And, uh, it, and psychologically, it probably puts you in a dilemma. What do I do with this now? I think that's why most people say, I'm not going to say anything. I wrote a basic letter to all 88 counties, uh, you know, sheriff's departments, say if you get a Bigfoot report, don't laugh it off, don't throw it away. If you don't want to deal with it, send a witness to my way. If somebody reports a Bigfoot, like in a small town, it's very possible they're going to get teased, they're going to get bullied. Most people thicken up their skins um, because um, you know, there's a motivation behind that bullying, and it usually has nothing to do with you. I would say to people, if you're being bullied, um, you're not alone. There's far more people than you realize who are believers in Bigfoot, who are studying Bigfoot seriously, and you need to start looking for them because they're out there. I'll have people, the witnesses I'll talk to, you know, and uh, they'll tell me that it was a, they hope they never see another one, and uh, it was so scary. And then other people, you know, they'll realize, you know, that how it's really a gift, you know, that they got to experience something that hardly ever anyone else will ever get to see in their lifetime. Whether these sightings are really Bigfoots or a case of misidentification or a mere hoax remains controversial. But one thing is clear. Most of the witnesses are forever changed, never to live the same life again.